This morning we will hear 2022-30772, Carbon 6 Barrels versus Proof Research. Mr. Keegan, you may proceed. Morning, Your Honors. Morning. I'd like to uh, first address the district court's holding that the underlying litigation cannot support a LUPA claim by Carbon 6 because it wasn't a named defendant in that litigation. Um, as is fully explained in the briefing, uh, McGowan was sued in that litigation as McGowan doing business as a carbon six because proof erroneously believed carbon six was a DBA of McGowan rather than uh, a separate entity. So they sued the wrong party by mistake. The entire lawsuit is directed at carbon six. McGowan doesn't make or sell carbon wrapped barrels. All of the allegations were against the conduct of carbon six in its manufacture of carbon wrapped barrels. Uh, so the, the lawsuit, make no mistake, was against the interest of and was directed at carbon six, sought to suppress and eliminate the sales of carbon six, uh, and the cease and desist letter that was sent prior to the lawsuit was sent to carbon six's offices in Louisiana, not to McGowan's offices in Montana, where that company is located. Um, furthermore, that, those facts came out during the underlying litigation, and proof indicated that it now understood it named the wrong party, that Carbon-6 was a different entity, and that after the trademark cancellation proceeding, when the case came back to Montana federal court, it would amend the complaint to name carbon six, uh, the, the, the proper party. So uh, the court's holding, district court's holding elevates form over substance in saying that carbon six is not the right party to sue for the damages that the underlying litigation caused to carbon six. Uh, next, the court held as a per se rule that filing a meritless lawsuit can never be the basis of a LUTPA claim. Uh, that simply isn't true under the, uh, uh, the, the weight of cases. And in fact, there's no case that holds that as a per se rule. The court relied on a case that said, um, that involved suing an attorney for his actions in litigation. And the court said that you, you, can't, you can't bring a LUTPA claim against an attorney because of his conduct as an attorney representing the opposing party in litigation. Said, the court said that's what the, the ethical rules are for. Um, so the, 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 the GR restaurants case, exclusively relied upon by the district court, simply isn't applicable uh, because it pertains to an attorney. These issues are discussed beginning at page 11 of our brief, and we cite multiple cases involving an actual party who got sued, countersuing or bringing a later suit under LUTPA because the original suit against it was meritless uh, or based on uh, you know, knowingly fraudulent um, uh, grounds, which is the case we have here. So clearly the weight of authority um, says that the underlying litigation here, um, which was to enforce a trademark that it turned out proof knew was invalid from the time it applied for it, uh, for the reasons given in the cancellation proceeding when that tribunal ultimately did invalidate uh, that trademark. Um, next, the district court uh, turning to the prescription issues now. Um, under the analysis we lay out in the brief, which is supported by the authorities that we cite, May 20th of 2021, when the uh, trademark tribunal canceled, ruled and canceled the trademark as being invalid, is the earliest date on which prescription could have begun to run under either of our two causes of action, the defamation claim 
for the unfair trade practice claim. Um, the reason for that, uh, to discuss the defamation claim first, is this settled rule in Louisiana that um, if you're bringing a defamation claim on the basis of allegations made in a lawsuit, you have to allow the lawsuit to finish to give that court an opportunity to determine whether the allegations had merit or not before you can bring your defamation claim. Um, in fact, there, there, there's cases that dismissed defamation claims as premature because they were brought either as a counterclaim in the same suit or, or as a separate suit when the defamatory suit was not completed yet. So uh, we couldn't have brought this lawsuit for defamation before, at the earliest, May 20th of 21, when the trademark was invalidated. And really, frankly, it took a couple more months before the, the case to get back down into the Montana District Court before it got actually dismissed there. So we're into the fall of 2021 before the rule is triggered in Louisiana that our defamation claim becomes ripe and can be brought. And it was, of course, brought within just a few months after that, well within the, the one-year prescriptive period. On the unfair trade practice claim, um, the same date, May 20th, 2021, is the earliest and, uh, that, that prescription could have begun to run, and that's because of the continuing tort doctrine. And we cite multiple cases where that doctrine is applied in similar type of cases. What do you do with Hogg and Crump from the Louisiana Supreme Court? In those cases, and as the court is well aware, it's, it's not just that the damages continue to suffer, but the offending conduct causing the damages has to continue in order for the continuing tort doctrine to apply. In those two cases, which involved the leaking tanks underground, the tanks were replaced with new tanks that didn't leak. So the, the tortious conduct, if you will, the, the continuous leaking was ended. Now, there had been uh, a, a gas or whatever was in those tanks still in the ground, and it was continuing to cause issues for neighbors, but the conduct had ended. And we go through a series of cases, and in fact, we talk about courts that distinguished those cases on that ground where the conduct and the damages continued um, for a period of time to within one year or whatever the prescriptive period was of the current suit under consideration. In this case, the underlying conduct is the attempt to enforce a fraudulently obtained trademark that proof knew uh, was invalid. Um, and that conduct involved a series of actions that, that continued up until uh, the um, May 20th ruling but after which, a few months after which, they voluntarily dismissed their Montana um, uh, litigation. But the, um, so there's two lines of cases we rely on there. Um, there's the one that simply says if your conduct is continuing and you keep taking steps in furtherance of it, such as continuing the underlying litigation, continuing, because remember, it's not only lost sales that we're trying to recover in this case with because of our sales being suppressed by this, this trademark dispute for several years. It's also the attorney's fees we incurred, because in a trademark proceeding before that board, even if you win, they don't allow you to recover for attorney's fees. They don't allow you to make counterclaims for defamation or unfair trade practice or anything else. It's strictly limited to the validity of the trademark. So, okay, so timeliness aside, though, is your theory that under LEPTA, Every time a company tries to enforce a trademark that is later invalidated, the company has violated Louisiana law? I would say you don't have to go that far at all in this case. Um, we've got to prove that they knew it was invalid at the time that they applied for it. And they, therefore, they are committing fraud on the Patent and Trademark Office, which is not only a civil violation, it's also a crime. So if there's a good faith attempt, it's okay, but if they are not in good faith because they're aware that it's not valid, 
in there in, that it is a it is a violation of LUCTA every time? If well, I'm only asking for, to reverse the district court's ruling that in I don't think this court has to go that far. I think this court would only have to rule that if someone knowingly files a claim on a knowingly invalid trademark, that 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 rises to the level that could be a LUCTA claim. I, you know. But I mean, is it repeated LUCTA claims every time you're trying to enforce it in any context? Well, yes, sure. Okay. Um, you know, so I would refer the court to the cases in our brief on, on cases involving a series of acts that constitute breaches as opposed to just one initial event that might cause damage over a long period of time, but um, uh, that's not this case. This is a case where uh, these claims were filed knowing they were without merit, and actions were taken repeatedly in the market, in the litigation, in more than one tribunal uh, to continue to inflict damage on the uh, on, on carbon six. Um, so so I, I guess the, the short answer to your honor's question is no, I wouldn't say that filing a lawsuit when you had a good faith belief that it was meritorious and just Losing in the end, somebody's going to lose every time. That can't be a lot to claim every time somebody loses a lawsuit. So I hope that answers the court's question. Thank you. Uh, the last item I would address... But I did want to refer the court to, uh, because I didn't really complete the discussion, but the, um, the Lemke case we rely on, on the defamation claim for the uh, proposition that you don't have to be a party to the lawsuit. Now, we know substantively Carbon 6 was the party. Uh, they were just mistakenly not named. But the Louisiana courts are clear you don't have to be the party in a piece of litigation to bring a defamation claim arising out of it if defamatory statements are made about you in that litigation. And they certainly were, since all of the allegations in the underlying litigation in, in Montana were actually directed at Carbon-6, even though McCowan had uh, originally um, accidentally been named. And I will, uh, that completes my argument, unless um, your honors have any questions. You saved time for rebuttal, sir. I did. Ms. Siegel? Your Honors, may it please the Court, my name is Kyle Wallace Siegel, and I represent uh, Proof Research Incorporated in this matter. Um, I'm going to take uh, Mr. Keegan's arguments as he presented them. The first is um, whether Carbon-6 was the real party in interest in this case. And this, of course, matters because in the complaint, and I'll remind the court that um, this was decided below on a motion to dismiss. So we're taking the, the four corners of the complaint as it's presented. And in the complaint, Carbon-6 uh, argues that in support of its LUPA claims that uh, a lawsuit was filed against McGowan, or proof filed suit against McGowan and falsely accused McGowan of trademark infringement. Um, and now on appeal, when the district court rightly said that um, you, can't, uh, you can't file suit to protect a sister corporation's interest, for the first time, Carbon-6 is declaring it's the real party in interest. Um, and that just doesn't square with the history of this case, Your Honor. Um, if Car The, the allegation that Carbon-6 was the real party in interest, I think that's, that's before the court for the first time on appeal. Um, below, the uh, Carbon-6 uh, let set forth uh, you know, a litany of bad acts that it said qualified for a LUPA claim. Two of those were that, the, that proof falsely accused McGowan of trademark infringement and filed suit against McGowan 
in the Montana litigation to protect its trademark. Um, and the district court below said, well, that can't qualify as a LUTPA uh, claim because um, a sister corporation can't file suit to protect the interests of, a, of another sister corporation. And now on appeal, Carbon 6 is saying, well, we were the party in interest all along, which directly contradicts the history of this lawsuit. When Proof filed suit against McGowan uh, in, in Montana, it was McGowan that immediately turned and filed suit in, before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. It was McGowan that prosecuted that action for three years, never brought Carbon 6 into the proceedings. And only now, uh, in order to get around the, the prescriptive period, are they alleging that Carbon 6 is the real party in interest here. So I think given the history of the case, given that McGowan was the party who prosecuted these actions over the six-year lifetime of this of this trademark dispute, uh, it's simply incorrect to say that Carbon 6, uh, they shouldn't now be able to say that all along Carbon 6 was the real party in interest. Um, Your Honor, <clears throat> Ms. Your Honors, Mr. Keegan also addressed um, whether a meritless lawsuit can be the basis for a LUTPA claim. I would remind the court that even to reach this issue, the court first has to decide that Carbon 6 was the real party in interest because this lawsuit was filed against McGowan. And secondly, it has to determine that the continuing tort doctrine applies, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, if the court is still with Carbon 6 after these two, after these two arguments, which are, I think are substantial hurdles to what they're addressing, um, then we get to the issue of whether a, LUPA, whether a lawsuit can qualify as a LEPA claim. And Your Honor, Your Honors, I think the answer is under Louisiana law extremely rarely and certainly not under these circumstances. Uh, the district court cited the general rule, which is correct, that the act of filing a lawsuit does not rise to the level of an unfair trade practice. And certainly in this instance, your honors, um, uh, opposing counsel spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about the meritless lawsuits that were filed. I think the court can take judicial notice even on a motion to dismiss of what's in the record. The TTAB, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, um, issued a 65-page precedential opinion about the issues, the trademark issues uh, that were at, at issue in, in this case. Um, in order to even get to its trial opinion, proof had to survive summary judgment, which it did. Uh, the opinion, the 65-page- This page is not the bad faith example. I wouldn't, I, I certainly don't think so, Your Honors. Um, this was a, 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 this was an extremely long uh, dispute about whether Proof's trademark was functional. It was a technical, highly scientific issue um, that involved four or five years, three or four years of litigation and- um, so We are on the dismissal stage, so perhaps he's, you advance your other arguments first. Right? Sure. Um, uh, and Your Honors, next, um, I wanted to address the continuing tort doctrine. Uh, Judge Elrod, I, I think that um, raising the Hogg opinions and the Crump opinions is exactly right. Hogg has been the seminal case in Louisiana since 2010, I think, about the continuing tort doctrine. And, and what Hogg says is that um, the continuing tort doctrine is a conduct-based one. Um, asking whether a tort visa perpetuates an injury through overt, persistent, and ongoing acts. The fact that a litigation is outstanding is not an act. It is the, you know, under Hogg, it would be described as the continuing ill effects of the fact that the lawsuit was filed. The fact that the that, uh, proof uh, continued attempting to enforce its trademark until the TTAB's decision in 2021 is not an act. Act, it's the continuing ill effects of registering the trademark in the first place. Um, I think the district court uh, understood that the opinions that that Carbon Six relies on appear here, Fox and Capital House, um, chafed against uh, what the Hog Court said uh, in in 2020. Um, Carbon Six alleges a litany of bad acts that it says should give rise to a LUPA claim, but that's exactly what they are, Your Honors. They are acts. 
They are discrete acts that had discrete time periods within which uh, Carbon 6 could file suit here. And the very last bad act that they have described in this litigation occurred in November of 2020 when Proof filed its, uh, when Proof filed its trial brief in the cancellation proceedings. And I have, I have yet to see Carbon 6 articulate an act that occurred after that trial brief was filed that would give rise to suspending the LUTBA prescription period even further. Um, I hog controls here, I think the district court recognized that. And, um, and because of that, the very last time that uh, Carbon 6 could have filed suit here would have been in November of 2021. I, I also think it's important you know, beyond applying, applying hog and crump here, it's important for the court to understand that as far back as 2016, Carbon 6 was um, cognizant of the potential claims against it. In response to the cease and desist letter that, uh, that Proof sent to it in 2016, Carbon 6 was already saying that Proof's uh, information that it provided to the USPTO was riddled with half-truths and contradictions and misrepresentations. It knew in 2016 that it, was a, that it believed that the trademark was registered fraudulently. And yes, there were acts subsequent to that uh, which could have triggered the LUTPA period, but um, they repeatedly sat on their rights uh, throughout this litigation to, to bring the allegations that they are now bringing in 2022. It was McGowan that decided to leave the Montana litigation and move this dispute over to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board where uh, it, didn't, it didn't bring Carbon 6 in as an indispensable party. And before the TTAB, they, they couldn't ask for these types of damages. So for now, in, in what they are doing now is the, the natural consequences of this, the decisions they have made throughout this litigation um, to, to sit on their rights. And, and even after the, the lawsuit ended in May of 2021 and was dismissed in August of 2021, they still waited for six more months before filing suit in, in Louisiana. So for all of those reasons, I, I think it's clear that they the dis said it was just a couple of months till it could get back, or that's, it was really six months. Well, and, and what's interesting, Your Honor, is that in August of 2021, after losing before the the TTAB, um, Proof went to the Montana court and voluntarily dismissed the litigation. Uh, they had had it; it, it was stayed while the TTAB was was uh, addressing the functionality question. Uh, um, regarding the trademark, and Proof went back to the Montana District Court and d voluntarily dismissed the litigation. They said, we lost before the TTAB, we're not going to prosecute uh, this action any further. And McGowan actually tried to stop the suit from being dismissed. They said, we have counterclaims we want to file. So in August of 2021, McGowan, and I think by extension Carbon 6, since they're controlled by the, by, by the same individual, knew that they had rights and still waited another six months to bring this lawsuit. But it, it, it's clear under Louisiana's rules of prescription that um, the one-year prescriptive period applies both to the LUPA claim and to the defamation claims. And the very last act, as, as interpreted by the Hogg decision and the Crump decisions, occurred in November of 2020 when Proof filed its trial brief in the cancellation proceedings. The, uh, Carbon 6 that alleges that, um, that there were defamatory statements uh, within that brief. Carbon 6 has not articulated an act that occurred after that brief was filed that would qualify for the suspension of the LUTPA period, in, uh, of the prescriptive period into the one year, um, into the one year period before they filed suit in February of 2022. Not to belabor the point, but can you please go back to what whether or not the prescriptive period is suspended during the pendency of the lawsuit that, that, that they, he said in the argument, your, post, your friend on the other side, that you must, um, you must stop and you cannot go forward under Louisiana law if there's a pending lawsuit and it's not gone all the way to the end. Sure. Um, you know, I would like to address, first of all, the fact that um, you know, we do believe this was a good faith 
filing and the fact that the TTAB opinion was 65 pages sort of, you know, I think supports our point. Um, but no, I don't think the pendency of a litigation suspends the prescription period until the end of the litigation. Um, it, the district court actually addressed this very question that said, it can't be the rule that prescription is suspended so long as the perpetrator of a fraud fails to correct his false statements or fails to, you know, continue to uh, in, try to enforce its trademark. Such an exception would swallow the rule. You'd never have a prescriptive period except when a fraudster willingly disclosed his fraudulent conduct. Um, the Miller v versus ConAgra case, the, uh, su the Louisiana Supreme Court case, actually addresses this and says that it's axiomatic that a defendant is allowed to explain its reasons for terminating a contract, a contract was in dispute in that case, without having its assertions be construed as a continuous violation of LUTPA. To hold otherwise would be to require a defendant to choose between admitting liability on the one hand and extending prescription by pursuing his defense on the other. We cite that in our uh, appellee brief, and I think that's squarely on point with the question that you've asked. Um, I briefly want to address the defamation claim. Um, you know, Louisiana law is clear that um, defamation uh, claims are only suspended till the end of a lawsuit if, if you're a party to that lawsuit. And um, again, Carbon 6 was not a party to the lawsuit from which the alleged defamatory statements came. And so because of that, again, the last defamatory statements were made, alleged defamatory statements were made in November of 2020, and, um, and Carbon 6 was required to file suit by November of 2021 based on those alleged defamatory statements, and it did not. Um, Your Honors, I would like to spend a few minutes discussing the issue of personal jurisdiction. I'm, I'm happy to entertain any other questions on this issue, but we did raise jurisdiction as a as a um, separate reason to uphold uh, dismissal of the suit here, um, and uh, I, I, which you know the, the Fifth Circuit is is allowed to uphold a decision for any reasons that are um, for based on any of the arguments that are addressed below. Um, in in this particular case, uh, we had one. Um, one cease and desist letter that was used as the basis for establishing personal jurisdiction uh, in Louisiana. Um, and to remind the court, Proof is a, is a Delaware corporation with Mon a, a Montana pr uh, principal place of business. McGowan's a Montana LLC and Carbon 6 is a Louisiana LLC. The one direct contact with Louisiana was the cease and desist letter that Proof's attorney sent to uh, the headquarters of Carbon Six in, in Baker, Louisiana, back in 2016. Um, Why isn't the defense distributed the gun case? If isn't there only one letter from the attorney general in that case, and that was plenty fine? There is, Your Honor, and and I know Your Honor was on that panel, so I I, um, I will try my best to distinguish it for you. Um, there are actually five decisions in the Fifth Circuit that address whether one cease and desist letter can be the subject alone of personal jurisdiction. Um, the Stroman Realty cases, the Bulkley case, which uh, Judge Willett, you were the author of, and the Halliburton versus Ironshore case. And, and those four decisions said that one cease and desist letter is not sufficient. Your Honor is correct that the dis defense distributed case uh, decided that one cease and desist letter was sufficient in those particular circumstances. Um, as Your Honor may remember, in that case, the New Jersey Attorney General was attempting to enforce a nationwide ban of the sale of products um, that this we Texas company it well. made. Excuse me? You said, as we may remember, and I just said, we remember it well. Go um, keep going. Sure. Um, and, and the district court, I believe, uh, Apply rule is sort of a bright line rule that whenever a company is a uh, a company is attempting to enforce something nationwide, that personal jurisdiction uh, attaches. Um, with respect, I think because we are in the context of um, intellectual property here, patent rights, trademark rights, those by definition, uh, patent holders and trademark holders 
by definition have nationwide rights that they are entitled to enforce. So in, in, that, in the Gruel case, I think the court was a, a little frustrated with the New Jersey Attorney General's attempt to uh, enforce this nationwide ban of the sale of firearms rather than saying, I don't want my constituents in New Jersey to be able to buy your products. The New Jersey Attorney General is saying, I don't want anybody to be able to buy your products. But here, the only rights that patent and trademark holders have to enforce are nationwide rights. Um, and I think uh, the Gruel Court recognized that there are some policy concerns when a cease and desist letter, uh, one cease and desist letter is enough to establish jurisdiction. It, it said in footnote 10 of its opinion, um, if the price of sending a cease and desist letter is that the sender thereby subjects itself to jurisdiction in the forum of the alleged rights infringer, the rights holder will be strongly encouraged to file suit in its home forum without attempting first to resolve the dispute informally by means of a letter. That's what Proof was attempting to do here by sending its cease and desist letter. Um, I think the, the policy concerns of an, alter, uh, an alternative holding here are that in the context of patent and trademark, um, anytime someone tries to enforce its patent and trademark uh, by sending a letter to the headquarters of the potential infringer, it could subject itself to personal jurisdiction in the potential infringer's home state. Um, you know, proof could say, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I don't want to um, risk being hailed into court in Louisiana, so I'm just going to file a deck action in Montana rather than, um, rather than try to resolve this amicably. Conversely, if, uh, if a letter is sent to Louisiana, um, the potential rights infringer can say, hey, before this goes any farther, I know if I file suit now, I can litigate in my home forum. Um, I would urge the court to look at the federal circuit cases that we cited in our personal jurisdiction section of our briefing because I think those are helpful in understanding how this, how this issue is, um, is decided in the context of patent and trademark law. In particular, the Red Wing shoe opinion was, was exactly what we're dealing with here in our case. Um, a couple of cease and desist letters were sent by a patent holder to a potential infringer in, in Minnesota. The infringer filed a deck action in Minnesota and the Minnesota District Court said, that's not enough um, because, and it didn't focus so much on the minimum contacts prong of specific jurisdiction as it did the, uh, the fairness and the reasonableness standard, which, it, and it said, Standards of fairness demand that the patent holder be insulated from personal jurisdiction in a distant foreign forum when its only contact with that forum were efforts to give proper notice of its patent rights. This case is the Red Wing Shoe case. Proof was trying to do exactly what the patent holder in Red Wing Shoe did. And for those reasons, we think you can also affirm the decision of the, of the district court uh, for lack of subject matter, uh, lack of personal jurisdiction. Thank you, Your Honors. Addressing personal jurisdiction first, um, the actions were a little more extensive than described in Louisiana. There was the initial cease and desist letter sent to proof, I mean, I'm sorry, sent to Carbon-6. There was a second letter sent a few months later to Carbon-6's counsel, who is in South Carolina, but we cite the cases that say for jurisdictional purposes, if you send a letter to the council, it's deemed to be sent to where the client is located. Again, that was Louisiana. Um, proof also came down and deposed multiple witnesses who were employees of Carbon-6 in Louisiana. Further actions in furtherance of their enforcement of these invalid trademark rights. And finally, all of their conduct was intended to suppress sales and competition, and in fact, eliminate sales in Louisiana. And that's a key factor in personal jurisdiction is whatever acts you did, however infrequent they may have been, what sorts, were they intended to be ca uh, causing damage uh, in the state? And these clearly were because Carbon-6, uh, who is the obvious target of the litigation despite naming the wrong party, uh, is located in um, Louisiana. 
Council uh, argued that we've not raised the idea that Carbon 6 was the real target of the lawsuit. Our entire complaint raises essentially that issue. That, that is, uh, and of course it was raised to them in the underlying litigation, which caused them to realize they had named the wrong party and uh, state that they were going to bring in Carbon 6 uh, as the proper defendant. So that's what all of this has been about for several years since prior to my involvement. The notion that we've never argued Carbon 6 was the real victim and the real target in that litigation is... Um, I think delayed by the record, and certainly um, we cover that thoroughly in our briefing. Um, we're not seeking damages for McGowan in this case. McGowan was damaged because for every lost sale that Carbon 6 has, McGowan has a lost sale because Carbon 6 exclusively buys its barrel blanks from McGowan before it carbon wraps them. But our claim in this case is not to recover for any of those lost sales of McGowan, only the lost sales of um, Carbon 6 and the attorney's fees that it incurred in defending the, the uh, meritless litigation. The notion that we set on our rights during the underlying litigation. Um, so, first of all, on the defamation claim, it wasn't right until the underlying claim containing the defamatory statements is litigated. We've discussed that already. Um, but also, shortly after the Montana lit litigation was filed in December of 2017, the parties by agreement agreed to stay it and have the validity of the trademark litigated in the cancellation proceeding. McGowan, rightfully or wrongfully, was the named party in Montana, so it was the party in the cancellation proceeding when the two parties went over and fought it out over there in the validity of the patent. The case was stayed. There were no rights sat on. Proof couldn't have intervened into a stayed case. The cancellation proceeding went on for years until it was concluded in 2020. When that uh, cancellation proceeding was decided and the case went back to Montana District Court, Proof filed a... a, a um, Motion for voluntarily, voluntary dismissal of its claims, having lost the trademark validity issue. Immediately, um, Carbon Six's uh, and uh, McGowan's counsel at the time started preparing an opposition to that because it wanted to assert counterclaims and assert them at the first opportunity that it could when the case got unstayed, when it came back from the cancellation proceeding. That opposition, the, the court quickly granted the involuntary dismissal without hearing from the other party. The opposition was filed, but it was filed about two hours after the court signed the order dismissing uh, the claims upon Proust's motion. So there never was an opportunity to assert these claims. And yes, six months passed before they were brought because uh, Carbon Six had to find Louisiana counsel. Louisiana Council had to investigate the claims, and that, the, that took, uh, it was quite the record in the cancellation proceeding in terms of depositions and documents. So we had a year from that point in time. There's no rule that says we have to file in four months instead of six months. Um, one more thing on the prescription on the LUTPA claim, because if I suggested it, I didn't mean to that the LUTPA claim has the same rule that the litigation has to end before the claim is right. That's just the defamation claim. The, it's only for the defamation. Okay. All right. So on the LUTPA claim, of course, we're relying on the continuing tort doctrine. But uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, respond to about this, this, this debate over whether their conduct continued as long as they were pressing the invalid trademark rights up until May 2020, or, or, or whether it was... Time has expired, so you need to wrap it up. Okay. Or whether it was just the mere filing of a of a brief that was the last act, even though the litigation continued. I, I want to point the uh, court to the cases that we rely on that say if you're violating a statute, and they certainly are here by never going back to the trademark office and correcting their misrepresentations that allow the trademark to issue in the first place, which they have a continuing duty to do. As long as they're violating that statute, uh, prescription is continues to be suspended. Thank you. We have your argument. Thank you. Case is submitted. We appreciate the arguments made. We will stand in recess until one o'clock this afternoon.